Great, thank you. You didn't know I was also a talented ventriloquist. That was actually me throwing my voice. You didn't see my mouth move, did you? Um, <laughs> all right, so anyone who is here for extra credit, um, go ahead and put uh, write your name in the chat just so we can make sure to have you, um, uh, to have you recorded. And welcome to Tiffany. Hi, I am so sorry, I had an update. <laughs> oh no, I hate when that happens. Um, yes, Haley, Harper students too. So anyone who's here for extra credit, go ahead and put your name in the chat and that way we'll make sure that we don't miss you. Um, terrific. Um, so as you're doing that, I'll start off. Um, I just wanted to give a welcome and an introduction. Um, my name is Professor Laura Gonzalez. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I teach anthropology at Miramar College. Um, I am very excited to welcome uh, my uh, four panelists today. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each of them and then I'll let them do the rest. But um, our panelists are from each of the four fields, which is kind of exciting, um, except for the fifth field, which um, would be applied anthropology. And maybe some of us have done some of that as well, because that's the kind of thing that often um, research anthropologists also do. Um, so I'm just going to go through and give a brief introduction of everyone, then I will pass it on to my colleagues Annette from the Transfer Center, Lena from the Career Center, um, just for a couple of minutes of brief introduction, and then we'll get into the questions. So we have um, Tiffany Marquise Jones, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at Harper College in Palatine, Illinois. Um, to focuses on African American language and verbal arts traditions, and has just very recently completed a dissertation on Washington, D.C.'s spoken word poetry community. So, welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, also, Sean Bender who is a cultural anthropologist and in fact, one of my oldest friends. <laughs> um, he is an associate professor of East Asian studies at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Um, he's the author of a, of a book on taiko drumming in Japan called Taiko Boom from 2012. And he's currently writing a book on the use of robots in healthcare and care facilities. Welcome, Sean. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, Jessica McFeeters um, is the collections manager at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Um, as part of the San Diego Archaeological Center team, her goals include generating collaborative opportunities with local universities and communities to enrich and mentor students and community members that are interested in collections management, museums, and archaeology. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Andrew Petto is a biological anthropologist specializing in the anatomy of humans and other monkeys, he says. He's recently retired from teaching at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and served on the National Center for Science Education, Board of Directors, and editor of its publication for about 20 years. He has interests in human health, longevity, and chronic disease. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Andrew. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Annette for just a brief um, transfer center overview. Hi, everyone. Thank you to our speakers and thank you to the students for joining us today. My name is Annette Ignacio and I'm a counselor in the transfer center at Miramar College. So if you are a Miramar College student, we have a lot of wonderful transfer resources, even though we're online. So we have some transfer workshops. I'm gonna put the flyer in the chat box in just a minute after I'm done talking, where you can attend these workshops and we will talk about how to transfer to different universities. We also can meet with you individually to help you research different transfer options and all the requirements that you need to transfer. When you get ready to submit your application, we're happy to help you with your application. If you've been denied 
for one of the schools that you've applied to. We also have resources to help you appeal that decision, and we can talk to you more about that. We also have admissions representatives from the different public and private schools who are giving informational workshops to our Miramar College students. So we have a lot of great resources. We encourage you to sign up for our Canvas page, which I'm going to put the link in the chat box in just a minute, so that you can get all of these announcements and resources that we have to help you transfer. Also at Miramar College, we have some great anthropology classes that I know Laura is going to put up here. These are wonderful classes. You probably maybe have already taken some of these. And even if you're not an anthropology major, these classes are great to take because obviously you can learn a lot and they will transfer. So you can use them as transfer credit to the different CSUs, UCs, and even private schools and even out-of-state schools. So again, please see us in the Transfer Center and I'm happy to review that with you and we can help you out with your transfer process. Thanks, Annette. Uh, go ahead, Lena. Hello, everyone. My name is Lena Hickbert. I'm a counselor in the Career Center. Um, the Career Center is also available for appointments this semester um, virtually. If as you're um, listening to some of the topics today and um, just some of the speakers and you want to know what that means for your major, what that means for your future career, um, we're here to have those conversations with you. Um, I'm going to put our website in the, um, in the chat box as well, as well as some of the other events that will be going on this semester. Um, the best way to reach us and to make that appointment is to either get connected with our Canvas show, which is posted on the website, or to um, use, we actually have a UChat feature where you can chat with the counselors. And if you just um, utilize that feature and say, I'd like to make an appointment, um, you can, we'll get you um, set up that way. And um, like I said, we do career exploration. Um, if you're trying to figure out what major would be best for you or how this aligns with your career goals. Also um, developing resumes, cover letters, job search. We, we do it all in the Career Center. So, and we'd love to meet with you. Thank you, Lena. Um, all right, welcome to those students who are still coming in. Go ahead and put your name in the chat uh, if you are here for extra credit. Um, and let's get to our um, fantastic and interesting panelists. Um, so I will um, uh, direct the questions to a particular panelist. Um, when you're done, um, I can uh, be in charge of um, saying the panelist, the next panelist's name, just so we can avoid some of that awkwardness <laughs> of, uh, of Zoom where not sure when to talk um, and we'll sort of rotate through that way. Um, so Jessica, would you like to start off? Um, the first question is, tell us what you love about your job as an anthropologist and what you find challenging. Um, sure, uh, so what do I love? Um, a lot of things. I would say my favorite thing is just the opportunity to always be learning. Um, my career path, as you'll learn, was a little bit different, um, non-traditional. I did not have an archaeology background, but I have museum studies background, and that led me to my current career in archaeology. Um, so Basically, for the last two years, I've been getting a free education in archaeology, which has been a really great experience for me. Um, and I think that anthropology in general, our field is so diverse and there's so much variety in what you can do um, that that really is what caught my eye to get into it in the first place. Um, and I've been very fortunate to do many different things. Um, with challenges, I mean, COVID specifically, we can talk about right now. Uh, one of my main roles as the collections manager for the San Diego Archaeological Center is managing the lab. And we usually have about 30 volunteers and interns in here a semester, which is quite a bit of um, my job. 
And clearly that has not been happening for about a year now. We've had our lab closed to volunteers and interns. So I would say one of my current challenges is really figuring out ways to still connect with our current volunteers and interns and then in turn um, come up with remote projects and ways that we can continue um, facilitating those kinds of projects with um, students or just volunteers in general. Um, Cause that's really the backbone of any nonprofit organization. Um, I would say another challenge just it, as an archeologist um, and in the archeology span field for repositories, um, which we are, we house a lot of um, collections that come in because the city is doing uh, development or even not, and it doesn't have to be the city. It can be personal development for your houses. Um, let's say you wanna make improvements. Um, you always have to have an archeologist on staff and when things are dug up, um, the goal is for them to be placed somewhere where research can then be done. Um, a lot of times those projects stop short and then the funding is gone. And then how do we get those collections in? So we call that the curation crisis. Um, and it's really about finding um, better ways to get those collections safely preserved for the future um, and not just piling up at cultural resource management firms. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good amount of challenges to start with. <laughs> I mean, you had us at COVID, right? <laughs> right, yes, that's just an active challenge. Funding, I'm sure we could all talk about for a very long time as well. Funding is a constant problem, again, in the nonprofit world, so. I'll leave it at that though. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Andrew, same question. Um, what do you love and what have been some challenges uh, about your career as an anthropologist? Well, I like what Jessica just said. And to me, the greatest thing about anthropology is if it has to do with humans, it's anthropology. And that really opens up all kinds of opportunities. So um, I've had jobs working with undertakers, has to do with humans, right? Um, but it has to do with human biology, it has to do with human culture. So I think that's the greatest uh, part about that. Um, I think on the flip side of that, one of the big challenges is that everybody, they, everybody I talk to thinks they know what anthropologists do and most of them don't. <laughs> And so, you know, they, they make these comments, you know, I teach anatomy a lot. No, I do not aspire to be Dr. Temperance Brennan. I just, you know, I, I love that stuff. I love those shows. That's great. I love the anatomy they do, but that's not what I do. And that's not where I want to go. So I think, you know, those are, those are some of the things. Um, and I think uh, one of the things I see and it's one of the most interesting things if you look in the uh, AAA directory, American Association of Anthropologists, not the Auto Club. And if you look in that directory, you'll see when they list universities and colleges, they have a little thing that says anthropologists in other departments. And I think that's really, really informative for um, how often do we see a listing that says, accountants and other departments, you know, it's just, it's just uh, shows the breadth of the field. And I'll talk about more of that later, but I think that's enough for now. Great, thank you. Sean, same question. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think we're all thinking very similarly here um, because that is exactly what I sort of like about cultural anthropology as well is uh, you know, we get into these fields because we really are interested in this stuff. And it's really that passion for learning that um, sort of, um, I guess I would say is the thing that really kind of guides me in my everyday life as an anthropologist. So not only doing my own research, but then reading other people's research. So the ability to kind of continue learning more and more about uh, a subject that you're really interested in, which is as... Um, AJ pointed out, you know, humanity, people, learning more and more about people um, by reading others' accounts, but then also having the experience yourself of going and, you know, if you will, imposing on other people's time to learn more about them. And so I guess I would say one thing that hasn't been brought up yet is that is also 
you know, it's one of the most rewarding things, but it can also be one of the most challenging things. Um, actually making those kinds of contacts uh, with people out in the field, getting past that initial period of everybody sort of feeling each other out to make sure that, uh, you know, you can kind of work together. Um, getting past those hurdles can be a little bit of a challenge, but uh, once you do move past that, uh, it's really just a lot of exciting stuff to learn that emerges after that. So that's what I really enjoy. All right, thanks, Sean. Tiffany, what do you love and what is challenging about your career as an anthropologist? <clears throat> well, um, first I'll say, I, I definitely agree with Sean, especially in terms of reading others works. And I must say, I was recommended Tycho Boom. It's been on my list for a while. But um, because a lot of my work, uh, I looked into ethnomusicology and, and drumming. So I'll be circling them back around with you. Uh, as far as uh, what I love, it is the field that to me gave me the permission to be nosy. I'm nosy by nature. I'm naturally curious. And it allowed me to turn <laughs> my natural curiosity that used to get me in trouble as a child. My questions were always why, why? And I remember people just saying, because. And that never answered my question, right? Like that always got me in trouble and I didn't understand. I'm like, I really wanna know. And anthropology gave me many ways to know about so many things. And um, one of the main things that helped me understand as um, an African-American that grew up speaking a certain way that was considered incorrect, again, because I'm a linguistic anthropologist, so I look at how language influenced culture, I understand culture through the lens of language, and I didn't understand why I had such trouble when I entered in corporate America and I was surrounded by, I would say, mostly people that spoke uh, closer to the standard um, language variety, and I couldn't understand also why what I was, what was natural to me to speak was wrong, right? So it was the first field, specifically linguistics and the linguistic anthropology that allowed me to see what was happening that positioned certain languages above the other and in other communities above the other, right? So it gave me language to describe what I knew I was feeling, um, but couldn't really voice what I was experiencing, if that makes any sense. So um, a lot of my friends, when we have conversations, I'll delve more into this um, when we get to one of the questions that talks about how we talk to friends about our field. Um, we'll always have these sort of like intuitions that something doesn't feel right or something, I, I see this tension and the way that I'm able to kind of take what anthropology has given me and mm -hmm. make them make sense of things has been such a gift. Um, and a lot of my um, uh -huh. friends both love Missouri it. is a little racist but okay could everybody yeah. mute themselves please can I mute myself <laughs> I'm so, sorry go ahead <laughs> it happens um but yeah, a lot of the things that I was able to explain for them or just highlight for them, I just feel like anthropology has been a, a gift and a curse in that way. And when I say like a gift and a curse, um, one, it, in terms of a gift, it helped me celebrate my language, right? It helped me celebrate African-American language, African-American language traditions, my culture. Um, it helped me see um, the world as my playground, right? I, I just really embraced learning about all the nuances both here and abroad but especially African Americans which often gets told we don't have a culture here and seeing um, our culture through the lens of anthropology gave me validation it helps me give other people validation but in terms of a, a, a curse <laughs> when you can see everything and I am not by any means Sherlock Holmes but he is one of my favorite uh figures in literature and there was uh the second movie uh that came out Robert Downey Jr. played Sherlock in this movie. And he says, um, someone asked him like, you know, what do you see? And he said, everything. And it was almost like he said in a painful way. Sometimes you can't just watch a movie or listen to a speech or see an interaction in a conflict because you're just like, I, I have answers. I have reasons. I have suggestions, right? And you can't sometimes turn your mind off. I will also say some of the tough parts is, and I think it's um, Sean that mentioned it, or somebody, I'm sorry, um, 
entering into the field, when you immerse yourself into a culture, you exist in this world that's in between. You're neither a part of that community um, fully. You can only get as close as they allow you and only as close as close can get because you're an outsider. So you're always kind of struggling to kind of figure where you fit. And I will say the year that I got to immerse myself, I became really close with my community. So exiting was tougher. Having to mourn that process and step away and to almost kind of take this awesome experience and make it into science can sometimes be a struggle. But again, we're these citizens of everywhere and nowhere that just take these balances. You take the good with the bad, but overall, I love what I do. That's an awesome way to put it. <laughs> Thank you all for answering that question. All right, moving on to the next question. I'm gonna ask Andrew to go first. Um, and this question is about your journey. Um, how, how have you come to where you are now? So um, what about your college experiences, um, jobs, uh, the path that, uh, that brought you to where you are now and, and what you do um, uh, in your, uh, your current phase of your career? So, Andrew? Yeah, a long and winding road. Um, started out uh, really in my first anthro class, you know, the class everybody's got to take. And I was trying to decide between political science and anthropology for my required social science course, right? And at our college, they actually let you listen to a mini lecture by the professors. And the um, political science professor was named Dr. Dry, and he really was. And plus his class was eight o'clock in the morning on Mondays. <laughs> so at 11 o'clock was anthropology and the guy who actually gave the talk was really cool. Uh, and uh, we started learning this stuff and in our book, now this was a long time ago when, when genetics was really kind of still uh, taking baby steps. Lyndon Johnson was president. And so uh, I read a book about how uh, blood types in humans were similar to blood types in chimpanzees and gorillas. And I thought, wow, that's really, really interesting. And that sort of got me going interested in, you know, the biological aspects of humans and uh, their health and uh, their anatomy and all sorts of things. Did a little archeology span in that course. And again, got really involved with the skeletal stuff. And um, the first job I actually was offered after I left school was to be a contact tracer for the uh, State Department of Health. Uh, knocking on people's doors who have been named as um, contacts for venereal diseases. Um, but they didn't come with con it didn't come with combat pay, didn't come with hazard pay. And I ended up not taking that one. Um, also had a really interesting job offer as a result of physical anthropology uh, back in the uh, late 80s, uh, late 70s and early 80s. We stopped having a women's army corps and we had women joining just the army. And they needed uniforms, helmets, flak jackets, all that kind of thing. And the Army uh, Quartermaster discovered that women were not just short men. They actually had different shapes. And that if you wanted to get a flak jacket or a helmet or, or a gas mask that actually did its job, you had to redesign it and you had to know uh, um, the shapes of the women's bodies that it was going on. So there was us offered a job to do that. Um, I didn't take that one mostly because my wife objected um, to, uh, to doing that, having me do that all day long. Uh, but there were those kinds of jobs and um, I ended up using the medical stuff, uh, working in an emergency room, working in a school health department, working in a chronic disease hospital in the social sciences department. So um, I think again, the strength of anthropology to to just to, to follow up on what Sean said, I had a high school teacher that told me that higher education was learning more and more about less and less. And I find that anthropology is the opposite, that you have a doorway into more and more and more and more if you have the curiosity and the drive to go and do that. So I did a lot of stuff with medical things. And so a lot of the teaching I've done in the last 20 years has been people trying to go into medical and clinical types of jobs. Um, the course that, we're, that I teach, one of the courses that I teach and I'm teaching now is called Human Structure and Function. It's about 
how the human body works and what it's built like, but it's really, if you don't tell anybody, a stealth bioanthropology course. We're talking about life histories. We're talking about family uh, organizations. We're, you know, talking about communications. And yeah, we're talking about genetics and health and disease patterns and, you know, different kinds of ways that uh, various human groups interact with each other. So again, uh, we're kind of sneaking the anthropology into a biology course and uh, at the same time we're making you know connections for people who are thinking that they're going to be clinical kinds of people so all those kinds of things um, are the things that kind of uh, spread out from the basic anthropology that I started taking in 19 so long ago <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Jessica, same question. Um, tell us about your journey. Sure. Um, it was non-traditional and long. <laughs> uh, I joke about how I should be a doctor because I was in school for about 10 years before I got my bachelor's degree. Um, I started, at, well, let's start before that. I grew up in DeKalb, Illinois, which is um, near Chicago, Northern Illinois. And hey, Tiffany, <laughs> um, about as soon as I could, I got out of there because of the winters and just in general, always had been kind of fascinated with Southern California. Um, when I got here, I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, my brother decided to join me and we went to Mesa College together. Um, and I spent about five years on and off at Mesa, just really figuring out what I wanted to do, um, which I think is, should be more celebrated. Um, it was a great opportunity for me to really figure out what I wanted um, in an affordable way. And um, then shout out to the Transfer Center. They uh, helped me at Mesa um, get to San Diego State University. So by the time I was there, it was like, all right, I love history and I wasn't sure why or what I wanted to do with it yet, but I knew that I wanted to do something within that field. Um, I don't think history technically is part of anthropology, but I think that it should be. <laughs> um, I think they all go hand in hand, really, uh, those kind of social sciences. And um, I took lots of anthropology classes, uh, whether in the mythology and religion, um, really from an early start in that long education career and kind of was always like, well, you're not gonna make money in that. So you're not gonna do that for real. Um, but then I did. So when I got to San Diego State, you know, I had um, some really great courses, really great professors. Um, I got my bachelor's in history and in my last semester, <clears throat> excuse me, my last semester there, I started interning at the Coronado, <clears throat> excuse me, just losing my voice all of a sudden. Um, I started interning at the Coronado Historical Association uh, in Coronado um, as a collections intern. And as soon as I started working with uh, cultural resources, I knew it was exactly where I wanted to be. Um, being able to connect people and places with objects really um, drew me in. And I've been very fortunate since then. Um, I've worked for many different institutions, the Chicago History Museum. I kind of moved around for a bit after I got my master's in museum studies um, with a focus in collections management. Um, I worked at a natural history museum and handled live animals and was also the exhibit creator for that museum. I've worked as a volunteer specialist at a couple of different small museums, um, really kind of just throwing jobs together until I could make a full-time career out of it. Uh, while I was at the Chicago History Museum, and that was probably my most favorite job I've ever had. Uh, the people I worked with there were just incredible, very passionate, um, very professional, smart, smart people. Um, and the job in San Diego actually opened up uh, where I am now. And I immediately was like, yes, get me back there. I'm sick of the snow again. <laughs> 
Um, and, you know, when I came here, I was here uh, for my interview and my current director, um, you know, I kind of was just forthcoming. I have no archaeology background, but collections management is my passion. And one really cool thing about the museum field and collections management specifically is even working at so many different types of institutions, I've really been able to use my skills um, in the same and different ways and hone in on things that you do the same stuff um, for collections that are historic and archeological as well. Um, and we were really lacking that here. My predecessor was an archeologist. Um, he taught uh, at a couple of colleges around in the area, but he didn't have a collections management background. So our institution was kind of lacking a little bit of that. And I could go into more detail about that, but um, things like, you know, temperature and humidity uh, recording and monitoring. Um, I have to check for pests a lot. That's a big part of my job is making sure the wrong types of things uh, don't get in here. Um, and yeah, so just things that, you know, every type of collecting institution should have in place, um, but that just wasn't really part of that archaeology niche. So um, yeah, now I am here and I've been here for about two and a half years and I love this just as much. That's great. Thanks, Jessica. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to jump over to Tiffany. Tiffany, uh, same question. Tell us about your journey. I, uh, yes, uh, like Jessica, it has been a winding road, a non-traditional path. It was anything but a straightforward shot. And, um, I'll be honest, I did not know about anthropology exactly in undergrad. I didn't, and if I did, it was because I took this one really cool class on culture through film, but I didn't know you could major in something like that. It was an elective and I was just like, okay, that was fun. And I moved on, but I wanted to teach. I did know that very early on, even if you go look at my little kindergarten yearbook, it says, what do you wanna be? And I said, professor, so something stuck. Um, <laughs> But I thought I was gonna teach English. Um, and it's really funny how life happens. I was gonna enter in the creative writing program after undergrad. I had a writing minor, I had a portfolio ready to go, ready to submit to get into a graduate program because, and let me just say this, people, um, I had a guidance counselor in high school tell me things like the humanities couldn't get me anywhere. So part of the reason why I also maybe did not um, find out more is because she led me to saying, well, what does your mother do? Computers, okay, do that, you'll make money. And I hated it, <laughs> hated it 100%. And, um, but I had that writing minor, so I had something creative that was still there. And right after I graduated, I got in a huge car accident. Um, my car was totaled. My portfolio was in the back because I just graduated. They scrapped my car, didn't tell me that I could come get anything out. So I lost my portfolio, all original work. Back then we had floppy disks, lost the floppy disk, lost the, everything. And I had to sit and think, well, okay, what else in English can I teach or want to do? And it was um, composition studies. And so when I got my, um, got into the program at Georgia State for what's called rhetoric and composition, um, I really loved it. I love breaking down how people communicate, how to deal with audience analysis. And um, <laughs> yeah, right. You, you don't get into this career for, for wealth. Um, but hey, you never know. Um, so when I got there, I loved, I loved that part of it. However, um, I had heard about this thing called African American Vernacular English in my studies there. I had also seen the way uh, in students of color, especially African Americans, came into the writing center and really struggled. And I took my last class there in linguistics and found like, oh, there's this long history of, through Ebonics, through Black language. And that sent me on the course to linguistics. That was my first linguistics class, my thesis was about um, African-American resistance to being told we speak this thing called African-American language. And that sent me back to, no, it did not send me right away to the PhD program. I lied to you. I took a 10 year, a five year break because 
after I got my master's, I was burnt out. And I said, maybe not my PhD, but it kept calling me because again, I kept seeing in the news things that I wanted to know. Things, especially around, um, I remember the trigger was the Rachel Gentile uh, witness testimony for Trayvon Martin trial. And I saw her being sort of dragged across the coals because of how she spoke and how she had a lack of credibility um, because of how she spoke. They use her Haitian background and lack of education against the truthfulness of her testimony. And I remember being at work, working at a publishing house and being like, I don't wanna be here. <laughs> Why am I here? Uh, this cannot help me get to this. And I remember I was talking to everyone in the office about this case and they couldn't care less. And I was like, I need to be around people who can have these conversations. Now that sent me back to going to linguistics. And it's a, a longer story how I got to University of South Carolina. But what I will say is when I started focusing on linguistics, which is a huge and awesome field in and of itself, it didn't let me get to the sociocultural questions really of the why and the how that I wanted to know. It helped me describe language, but not help me see how it was working in interactions. And so when I was there, I was able thankfully to switch into the anthropology department um, because the linguistic anthropologists and the sociolinguists had a really good tie. So both those departments work well together. It was the best decision I ever made. I was the first linguistic anthropologist to come out of ling um, anthropology in USC, University of South Carolina. And I remember them telling me, you're gonna struggle a little bit because you don't have this undergraduate background in anthropology. You did not get that in your masters. You're gonna to have to start over with bio ants. You're gonna to have to start over with archeology. span They were right, I struggled, but I am so glad I did that four field program because now I teach a four field course and I'm able to see um, linguistic anthropology, bio arc, um, medical anthropology, applied anthropology, all work together. I get to see the threads between all four. And now my linguistic anthropology friends are like, I never get to talk about that. And I'm like, ha ha, you know? So I, I actually get to talk about things like in museum studies, like representation, because I do still deal with that or um, race issues within bioanthropology, um, cultural resource management and how graves and sites um, are taking over and what the legalities are. I never thought I would do that, but I will say something um, that was said earlier. You never see like, you know, someone teaching English necessarily that's gonna be pulled into a biology discussion. I love that as a linguistic anthropology, I get to do that. I get to participate in so many of the other ologies and other uh, discussions around humanity. And it just, it, it, it lets me geek out in a way that I can't anywhere else. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, also, the great thing about teaching at a community college that you get to teach all kinds of things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Okay, Sean, tell us about your journey. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'm going back to Andrew's uh, choice about political science and anthropology, and I, I chose wrong. I actually was a political science major as an undergraduate and was, was Desk, well, bound for law school early on. And then I ended up going abroad, like on a junior year abroad thing to England, primarily, you know, looking back now is surprising to me, but because I didn't want to study, didn't want to study a language. <laughs> and so I thought, but I really wanted to go somewhere different. And so I ended up going to the UK, figuring that, okay, well, it'll be an abroad experience, but it'll be pretty, pretty similar to what I know in the US. And while obviously, I found out quickly that, as the, as the saying goes, the UK and the United States are two countries separated by a common language. And that's indeed what I found. I mean, a very, very different um, kind of place, different way of thinking. And I thought to myself, what would it be like to go somewhere where the language is really different and that is really distant from a kind of European heritage, like a, a place like the UK? Um, when I was traveling, actually in Scotland, of all places, I, I met... Uh, a young woman who was also in university and was hoping to go to Japan after she graduated uh, to teach English. And I said, that sounds really cool. I think I'd like to try that too. And so went back and um, in my last year as an undergrad, I, I wrote an, a thesis, like, a, like an honors thesis for the department. And I really enjoyed the professor uh, that I worked with. And he was a really inspiring person. And, 
he told me about how much he loved coming to work each day. Uh, and he just loved absolutely being a professor. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's what I would hope to be someday as a person that even when I'm sort of in the middle of my career, even toward the end, that I'm still excited about what it is that I'm doing. And I kept that in the back of my mind. And I eventually went to Japan for almost, almost two years and did teach English and learned quickly that I didn't want to continue teaching English. And I also didn't want to go to graduate school in political science, despite this great advisor that I'd had. Um, and I got, I was interested actually in my last quarter of undergrad, I took an anthropology class. But other than that, I hadn't taken any anthropology before I went into graduate school in anthropology. So I kind of had a sense that it's what I wanted to do, even though I didn't have that actual ac academic background. And uh, so I, I actually felt a little bit, um, maybe a little like uh, Tiffany, un 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 unprepared for what I would eventually do in terms of my coursework. Uh, but eventually I caught up over the years of, of graduate school um, and then finished after my research and then ended up uh, landing this job, luckily, a few years after, after also teaching at uh, Mesa College. Uh, Jessica, you reminded me of that, which is, was an absolutely fantastic um, experience. So that's what led me here. Great. Thank you. Um, let's go on to our next question, and I'm going to ask Jessica first. Um, when was the last time a friend or family member asked you for your anthropology expertise for a problem that they were solving in their day-to-day -day life? Um, well, I will say constantly, whenever someone's moving, I get asked to help them pack. Uh, <laughs> putting things in boxes is one of my specialties <laughs> and my friends and family definitely take advantage of that. Um, in addition to that, I told you that I uh, am the pest manager. <laughs> uh, whenever anyone finds like a bug or something that they're unsure of, that comes my way as well. Um, so not really glamorous things, <laughs> but I, I can help them usually. <laughs> or I'll find something new out about a pest that I did not know before. <laughs> not the answer that I thought you might have. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I find a random bug in my house, I know. Yeah, just call. send me an email. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> um, let me jump over to Tiffany. Tiffany, what about you? Um, when was the last time a friend or family member asked for your anthropology expertise? So I, what I just found out is I needed Jessica in my life because I have moved like five times in the last two years. Oh my gosh, that's such a skill. Um, you know, it's funny. I never thought that my 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 job would be as useful as it was outside of the classroom. But it's 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 strange how, especially in COVID times, so many questions have come up that I've been able to help um, people sort of navigate. Not necessarily just through the language parts of things, which did come up a lot with, um, especially like the political conversation, how um, mask became politicized. And, you know, I was able, it's really, it's, it's tough because linguistic anthropology has such the ability to explain so many things, but we don't always do it in the most accessible ways. And um, one of the things I was able to explain um, to my friends are how symbols get mapped, uh, value systems get mapped on the symbols and how the mask became a symbol of something, right? And how that thing became a, a cultural symbol um, as well. And then also how people were really frustrated with um, the whole mask situation. So people were like, they told us to wear masks. Now they tell us to wear masks. They tell us, you know, now it's two masks. Next week is gonna be three masks. They told us six feet, now they're saying 21 feet and they were getting really upset and you know, wanting to like tar and feather Dr. Fauci. And I had to explain to them like science is a practice and it's going to take, it's a, a while to understand this new critter that has surfaced, right? It's a, it's a new, we're gonna see a cultural shift on how we, everything is gonna change from do we shake hands? do i mean it's little nuances and things that i was able to really just walk them through the conversation with um and help them to kind of see that 
because they also didn't understand how to process the science that was in the discussion where I really was able to kind of see, okay, they're not trying to trick you. Um, it's that they're telling you what they know in a specific moment in time. And what we know yesterday is not gonna be what we know today. It's not gonna be what we know tomorrow. Last, however many years ago, we thought we we're gonna fall off the face of the earth because it was flat. Today, we have a different understanding of that. Uh, and the same when it comes to this bug, right? This virus. And, and it, it's little things like that, you know, in the, the larger cultural conversation. But then it's also things like, I'm having trouble with my husband. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I hear and I ask them a question um, and I hear that it's literally a breakdown in communication. They think they're saying one thing. This person thinks they're saying one thing, but also they're coming from two cultural systems. Even if it's not two countries or two ethnicities, someone might be from the North, someone might be from the South, someone have different socioeconomic influence. And I've been able to like slow people down and say, hold on. Your norm is not the norm. It is what you've been socialized into as a right a habit. And they're like, I hate you, Tiffany. I was ready to like, you know, put my spouse or my partner on the couch. And I'm like, well, good luck with that. I'm kind of like, you know, this marriage counselor sometimes. But yeah, I I definitely love that my my job. And also I constantly am pushed to learn new things. So even if I might not know something now anthropologists taught me how to learn things so even my friends will come to me with questions and I'm like I don't know but I can help you know right and I think that's that's a good tool that anthropologists given me thank you um Andrew same question when was the last time yeah. a friend or family member asked for your anthropology yeah I think the most interesting uh one happens frequently is a friend or family member will show up with a bone and they will say is this human and the first thing i will say is if you are worried that it's human you shouldn't be throwing it in the trunk of your car and driving it to my house uh, the worst case and the one that actually encompasses all of my anthropology training was a friend of ours that lives in Vermont liked to go kind of scouting at an old colonial uh, fort on Lake Champlain and one day he shows up with a rib <laughs> and you know, and uh, I was staying at my in-laws place on the other part of the lake and he brings this rib and he says, you know, what is it? Well, luckily it wasn't a human rib. That's the good news. Uh, but I said, you know, that's a historic site over there. <laughs> you don't just go picking up random stuff off the ground and, you know, and I mean, you could get in serious trouble there. You know, oh, I was a colonel in the army and all that. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, you know, so it's sort of like um, getting people to understand that you know providence is important the locale is important the context is important and when you pick up this bone and move it around that stuff's all gone and all of the information that we could get out of this artifact is lost uh, but i think that's the most important thing i get that all the time uh, is this is this human i think that's the only time they come to me for advice Okay, thank you. Sean, you must have people coming to you all the time asking for your advice <laughs> in cultural anthropology. <laughs> yeah, not so much. You know, I was thinking about it and, um, you know, it's more like uh, experience abroad. So knowledge more of the area of Japan. I was thinking often, it's not so much that they ask me for like cultural explanations of things, uh, more it's people traveling to Japan. So I, I end up giving a lot of like restaurant recommendations for Tokyo. That's, that's, I think, I think I remember texting you and asking you for one while I was there. <laughs> that's what nine years of graduate school got me was uh, making ref recommendations for restaurants. So that's about the, the level of my expertise that they tap into. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you all. Um, so I do have another question, but I'd like to wait and see if any of the students who are here would like to um, unmute and ask a question. I see that there's some questions going on in the chat. Um, 